Um, uh, good morning. This is on the obstructed airway. I have eight minutes to try to persuade you to look at the head and neck chapter. You're being bombarded with information. The other authors on this chapter were Anil Patel, who is leading, and Paul Pracy, who is an ENT surgeon. And together we've come up with a large number of recommendations. Let me just give you a taste of what's in the chapter. Patient with an advanced transglottic tumor comes to theater. They need a tracheostomy. They're going to have some radiotherapy. They're wor worried about the size of it. Anesthesia is induced with total intravenous anesthesia in the anesthetic room. Intubation is attempted with a video laryngoscope repeatedly. The oxygen saturations fall. They can't ventilate the patient. They try a needle cryothyrotomy in dire situations. The patients are really arrested. The surgeon comes through the door, tries to intubate, but it's all too late, and the patient has died in the anaesthetic room. Now, in the NAP4 project, there are 72 reports which relate to patients with head and neck disease. About 70% of them have what uh, you might term an obstructed airway. You can see that this is more than one-third of all cases in the project. Head and neck cases, therefore, can be identified as high risk, and consequently, if you like, we can, I think, make a very substantial uh, uh, um, benefit uh, by acting together as head and neck anaesthetists in reducing this large number of uh, problems. You can see the qualifying events uh, uh, for admission to the NAP4 project in head and neck disease, death or brain damage, emergency surgical airway, uh, 50 and unexpected ICU admissions, 27. It's not surprising the emergency surgical airways are so large a number uh, because it often is part of a management strategy in head and neck disease. And at the outcome, at the time of form completion, you can see there are 17 deaths. So a large number, but also a large number of recovery as well. Airway obstruction, I think, is the clinical situation in which a patient develops signs or symptoms due to narrowing uh, or possibly distortion of the airway. The Cardiff group, who uh, have written recently quite a quite good article, I think, on clinical management of airway obstruction from their great experience, define it as blockage of the airway resulting in reduced or absent gas flow to and from the alveoli. There are about 50 patients with airway obstruction in the NAP4 data. Most of them have presented with stridal, but not all of them. A number are chronically obstructed and have very little in the way of symptoms. They're coming for Anesthesia in theatre in daylight hours managed by consultants for diagnostic or resective surgery, possibly drainage. A number, and they have run into problems at maintenance, some of them uh, at induction, some of them during maintenance as well, uh, and a number at extubation as well. They're coming sometimes to theatre just to have the airway secured. Sometimes they're admitted through the emergency department, either managed there or rushed along to theatres. Uh, or sometimes the problem starts in ITU, uh, in, uh, uh, usually after head and neck disease, uh, resection or securing the airway. Here's an ASA elderly patient, scheduled for panendoscopy and biopsy of an airway tumour. He appeared quite comfortable, didn't uh, alert anybody that there was really much trouble. No airway investigations at all had been done and general anaesthesia was induced. It was found that the tumour obscured the larynx. They were unable to intubate or to ventilate, and the patient suffered a cardiac arrest. The ENT surgeon rescued the situation with a surgical tracheostomy. The patient was resuscitated, but died later from their disease. Here's another patient, a middle-aged but not obese patient, scheduled for biopsy of the tumour of the base of the tongue. They had undergone radiotherapy. The consultant anaesthetist did not expect any problems. However, after inducing general anaesthesia, it was very difficult. Uh, and again, the patient needed an emergency, emergency airway in the anaesthetic room. What learning points were there really from assessment uh, of the airway and planning in head and neck disease? The anaesthetist should be familiar with tools of assessment of the airway, MR, CT scans, looking at the patient. Strider and respiratory distress at rest may well not be present in chronic obstruction, and this caught out a number of the people submitting the report and a number owned up to the fact that they had been very casual in their assessment and didn't think there was much problem when the airway was very severely narrowed. Flexible nasendoscopy was identified as very useful and was the most common additional airway investigation used. There was benefit in reviewing the scans with the surgeon prior to starting. Clearly, the anaesthetist before starting should try to determine the degree of narrowing, the site of narrowing in its relation to the vocal cords and whether uh, the vocal cords are narrow, um, whether it is below the vocal cords extending into the trachea and the type of narrowing before proceeding. Here is a middle-aged ASA 
three slim patient presenting for elective clearance of infected tissue following pharyngeal surgery and radiotherapy. A lot of things were predicted to be difficult. However, the patient's uh, anesthesia is induced and paralyzed and uh, fortunately face mask ventilation is okay. But after four attempts at uh, intubation by direct laryngoscopy, there's so much bleeding that nothing can be seen. Ventilation is impossible and a surgical tracheostomy has to be performed. So how should we manage these sort of patients? Sadly, we always talk about the initial primary plan as though that is the way to deal with something. Inhalational induction is ingrained in our consciousness, almost certainly inappropriately, uh, if we talk about it as the only way that we're going to manage it. For inhalational induction in the NAP4 project, only in four patients, there seemed to be no particular compromise once an inhalational induction had been started in ventilation. But in 12 patients, the airway uh, became more difficult during the uh, spontaneous uh, ventilation induction, the inhalation induction, and in 11 patients, ventilation ceased uh, completely, uh, either because the airway had been lost or after an attempt at intubation, uh, ventilation uh, was not possible. What about another technique, uh, uh, direct laryngoscopy? Here, uh, a persistent theme is the deterioration very rapidly with attempts at direct laryngoscopy, sometimes after the first attempt. And in uh, 15 patients, uh, the airway disappeared uh, completely after attempts at direct laryngoscopy, and all these patients needed a surgical airway to rescue the situation. Mansouk has spoken about flexible fiber optic intubation. Um, there were more failures than success when used in these sort of patients. Uh, of the failures, of which there were 14, 10 were in the anaesthetized patient. And Mansouk, I think, has spoken uh, of uh, the preference to undertaking these in the uh, awake state, uh, if that is possible. However, you can see that everything I've spoken about so far, uh, inhalational, direct laryngoscopy and intubation, flexible fiber optic intubation, has all failed. We identified, uh, clearly, uh, none that have been successful as the primary plan wholly. Needle cricothyrotomy often fails, and Chris is going to talk about this now, but just let me tell you that in the head and neck patients, it was used 27 times, and it failed more commonly than it was successful. There is no point at all, in my view, of imagining, therefore, that this is an easy, useful te technique that is going to rescue it. It doesn't appear in practice to be so at all in these patients. We may love our anaesthetic rooms. Here is a person who returns to theatre after radical neck dissection. He appeared to be a fairly easy intubation initially. However, he comes back into theatre and is found, as is characteristic, that at uh, direct laryngoscopy, the tissues are extremely uh, edematous. Uh, and the larynx really can't be seen. It's remarkable how quickly this occurs. They're unable to intubate, very difficult to ventilate. The patient was rushed into theatre for a surgical tracheostomy with the intubating laryngeal mask in place. Fortunately, the thiopentone and succinothonium wore off and the patient was able to regain their airway and they had a tracheostomy under local anaesthesia. Why, though, was it started in the anaesthetic room? What is the benefit to the patient of starting that case in the anaesthetic room? What can the NAT4 tell us? We must move away from talking about primary plans to logical, coherent strategies. We must have a primary and backup plan. That is what a strategy is with the equipment and personnel. And the outcome clearly depends on the strategy, not our initial primary plan. There's no obvious benefit to starting a lot of these cases in the anaesthetic room. And if the backup plan is a surgical one, clearly there should be, uh, it should start, in our view, in theatre. And needle cricothyrotomy has a high failure rate in practice. We must reassess its position in our management strategies. The limitations of the NAP4 study are that successful primary tracheostomy under local anaesthesia wouldn't have been submitted. We don't know how successful it is. We assume it's successful. We wouldn't have seen it. We wouldn't have seen uh, a, tra a planned tracheostomy under general anaesthesia if everything had been uh, okay. We wouldn't have heard about that. Uh, we don't know, therefore, what successful, if you like, uh, airway management which did not lead to a qualifying event uh, because clearly we didn't get them. But remember that a surgical airway may well be part of a well-planned, well-conducted strategy for managing the obstructed airway. And just because they have one doesn't mean that anything has gone wrong. And the number of these patients were extremely well managed. Senior anaesthetic and surgical staff should be involved. 
Anesthetic anaesthetists should be able to gain useful information from the imaging obtained and they should be reviewed jointly with the surgeon. The level of obstruction should always be known, if possible, before starting. And if additional investigations haven't been obtained, you should consider flexible nasendoscopy at the very start with the surgeon to try to gain the information at the time you're about to start. It may well have changed from a scan taken a week or two weeks ago. Clearly the strategy needs to be agreed with everybody in the team before you start. And uh, if, in our view, if a surgical tracheostomy is the rescue option, and you can see how often it was a good rescue option, uh, better than needle cricothyrotomy, in our view the case should always start in the operating theatre with everybody assembled and ready. Multiple attempts at direct laryngoscopy should be avoided, and if fibre optic intubation is your primary plan, you should at least consider doing this in the awake state. Inhalation induction is bound to fail at some time and you must have a plan for when it fails. The patient clearly isn't going to always wake up, in fact very rarely wakes up at all. So a backup plan must be ready and emergency cryothyrotomy may not be successful. The team managing the case shouldn't disperse uh, until after extubation, if that is what is planned, until the airway is quite safe. And there are a number of cases in which only success were, uh, depended on the same team being with the patient with all the equipment ready to start immediately after extubation when things went wrong. And patients in ICU require a continuously ready strategy for reintubation if the tube dislodges or blocks. That is very much more difficult to organise than what we do in theatre, which is one point in time with a strategy. In ITU, it's got to be a continuous strategy for days. What is going to happen if this tube blocks or comes out? That's really, I think, very difficult. Thank you very much.